1995, Kennedy and I published the first paper where we were working at Research Triangle Institute in North Carolina. And what, what you're about to see then, you've seen it has roots in artificial life. I think the roots in engineering are going to come out uh, by themselves later on. And what we've done here is based on a Kennedy's adaptive culture model. One of the things that distinguishes this approach from any other approach that has been um, used in evolutionary computation, and some of those approaches include genetic algorithms, evolutionary programming, evolution strategies in Germany, and so on, is that we fly our solutions through the problem space. They actually move through the problem space, and that's how we're working on the solution. And we'll get into that in a couple more slides. Two books that Kennedy and I have participated in that talk about this, the very first one, 2001, and our computational intelligence book that has some updated information on swarms uh, published more recently. So what's a swarm? Let's move into the particle swarm optimization itself. Well, it looks like a disorganized collection of, of individuals that, that, but they tend to cluster together, but each individual seems to be moving in a pretty random direction. I also put the second bullet in there in, in deference to Jim Kennedy. He uses swarm to describe a certain family of social processes. Everything I'm going to talk about from now on is oriented toward engineering, computer science, and solving business problems and logistics problems and warfare problems. Jim Kennedy is still hard at work using this approach to look at societies and social processes. So, it's simple, it's easy to implement, it's computationally efficient, and it's been effective for us on a wide variety of problems. How did it happen? I just I put one slide up here to say because it was this was an incredible process to me when I look back on it. We didn't set out to develop an optimization system. We had no intent of coming up with something that would be in the evolutionary computing field that would be used for optimization. What we were working on at the time was what we called the corn, or Jim Kennedy called it, the cornfield vector. We had birds up in a flock, we had predators, eagles, we had sparrows underneath them, we had corn on the ground. And of course, the, the eagles were trying to eat the sparrows, the sparrows were trying to find the corn, and, and the eagles also w wanted to find the corn, and I'm oversimplifying it, but we were trying to model that social system, that bird social system. And we started writing code. And we tried to use genetic algorithms, which was the leading um, optimization tool in that field at the time, and just couldn't make genetic algorithms work. So we started writing um, our own C code. And about 300 lines of code later, we had something that looked interesting. And I'll cut to the quick and say that we, we reduced the basic algorithm to two lines of computer code. And that's what we're still working with today. Now, this is my warning slide. The next four slides are going to have some math in them. And if you don't understand all of this, don't worry about it because you'll still understand how we use this technology. And I'm not going to get very deep in math at all. If you've had high school algebra, that's about the level of these next four slides. If you don't, if you don't get all of this, it's okay. Just you can, put your, you can put your mind to sleep for the next four slides if you're uh, intimidated by any kind of math. What we do, though, is something that's done in every evolutionary comp computation approach that's used. We start with a population, a number, a few dozen potential solutions to the problem. We initialize this population by assigning uh, random positions of velocities. And then we then fly them through the hyperspace, through the problem space. We may have 50 dimensions to a problem. We're working on a logistics problem right now that has 39 dimensions to it. What we do is we fly them through the space. We'll talk about how we do that on the next slide in more detail. But what happens is each one of these potential solutions we call a particle. Oh, and why do we call it particle swarm? Well, a uh, little slight side story here then. And uh, we were trying to figure out has anybody written any code like this? Surely, we have two lines of computer code. Surely somebody has done this before. Well, it turned out they had not. But the closest thing that came to it is some work that was done uh, at Santa Fe Institute by a leading researcher, Mark Malonis, and he called stuff that looked like our stuff a swarm. And so we decided, okay, this adheres to what he calls a swarm. There are five attributes that he listed as swarm, and we met all five of them. 
Why do we call it particle swarm? Well, I looked around in the code and found in the um, uh, in the annals of the computer ACM uh, Journal of Computer Machinery that a conference out in Anaheim, California, every year on computer graphics, it's a big computer graphics conference, that the guy had written some code for uh, the Wrath of Khan. Any of you, most, a lot of people have seen the Wrath of Khan, Star, uh, Star Trek, the Wrath of Khan, and all of the special effects in there were written by this one guy, and in order to generate the smoke and explosions in the Wrath of Khan, he, he wrote code that looked a little like what we wrote to generate the smoke particles. And all these smoke particles together made up the smoke clouds and the explosion. So we decided particles. Uh, we wish we hadn't called it particle swarm optimization, but rather particle swarm adaptation, because we're not always looking for optimization, but we won't get into that. So what happens with these particles? We have a population of particles. Each one keeps track of where it was when it had the best answer to the problem. They, we fly these particles around, and it, at, at a certain location in the problem space, it has values assigned to the variables that we're looking at. And we say, how well? What's its fitness there? What's its fitness now? What's its fitness now? Well, where it was when it had the best fitness is called p-best, particle best. Where the, the best of the p-best, the best solution in the population is called the global best, or G best. And then in one, there are two versions of particle swarm. From the very beginning, we published two versions, 1995 on. So one version is called the G best version, where we keep track of the P best for each particle, and the G best, which is one global value for the population. The other version of particle swarm, we keep track of P best, and we keep track of the best solution within a neighborhood of that particle. So we may have two particles on either side of it, and we keep track of which one has the best solution. That's called an L-best or neighborhood best. <coughs> so we calculate that, and then all we do at each time step is we accelerate each particle toward its P-best and toward its G-best or L-best if we're using a neighborhood version. That's the whole algorithm. And so here's the process. We initialize the population, including values and velocities. We look at the fitnesses. Then we modify the velocities based on previous best and global or neighborhood best, and we loop around, terminating if we get a good enough solution or we run out of time. Here are the here are equations. Don't choke on these if you're not mathematically inclined, but for those of you who have a little bit of math, our new velocity is equal to the old velocity plus a couple of constants, C1 and C2, a couple of random numbers that we multiply here, and these are it's not a typo, they're different random numbers twice a small r and a large r. And this term p sub id minus x sub id, you're not seeing my pointer, uh, Doc, I apologize for that, but uh, I'm following. I think you could follow. That's the difference between where we are, x sub id is where we are, and p sub id is p best. Then on the right, x sub id is where we are, and p sub gd is global best. These constants turn out to be about between one and two, figures are 1.5. So we update the velocity, and then we update the position of the particle. That's the entire algorithm. That's all there is. How are these particles connected together? This is the last technical slide. Well, the G-best topology is there on the left. Every particle is connected to everyone else. On the right, that ring structure, if you look at the top of the ring and you say your, your neighborhood is five, then it's connected to the two on one side and the two on the other side. And you go to the next one over and it's connected to two on one side and two on the other side. So they're overlapping neighborhoods. And the interesting thing is, we almost always use this neighborhood version now. The one on the left, the global version, is faster. When we have to have blinding fast speed, we can go to this. But this one always converges. And this is the version, the neighborhood version on the right, that was shown by a professor from Spain who got his PhD at Caltech. This is guaranteed to converge. So the, those are the what, the what the neighborhoods look like, and it helps sometimes to just sort of visualize what, so each one of those little ovals is a particle. And in fact, that's not a, that's not an unusual size for a population. We may have, looks like there's about 20 there. We often have a population of 20 or 30 or 40. Pretty typical size, size for population. Okay, so that's all the technical stuff. Now let's see how